Okay, so the title is written there, so I will not uh, you know, read it again. But uh, uh, just during the introduction, I was thinking about something else. You know, sometimes your thoughts are drifting somewhere you know, far. And then it, you know, it came to me somehow that uh, the previous uh, series of uh, talks uh, was about forced uh, liquid films. And now this is <coughs> a different kind of uh, forcing because you have some uh, uh, traveling thermal waves. And you do, uh, people may think that these people from uh, the Middle East, they are very uh, kind of uh, forceful and always use force. Well, let me stick to this. Anyway, uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about, uh, about the, uh, the topic which is shown there. And first, I would like to thank. Okay, I would like to thank first my collaborators, Professor Latsev uh, uh, from Georgia Tech in Atlanta, U.S., and his uh, student, Wendy Mao. Uh, and also, the most important part of this research, uh, funding from uh, the Binational uh, U.S. Israel uh, Science Foundation. Okay, so for uh, several years already, we will be thinking, uh, we're thinking about um, how to move liquid film, thin liquid film, from point A to point B uh, without using too brutal force. For example, if you have a, a thin film and you want to pump it or to move the liquid from one location to another location, uh, of course you can induce a pressure gradient and just uh, force it. Uh, from point A to point B, but uh, because of the fact that uh, films are very thin, okay, so to overcome this viscous stress, you must apply a very large pressure gradient just to be sure that it moves uh, to create sort of uh, net flow rate in a certain direction, and then, uh, well, some, uh, some liquids would not like it. For example, if you want to uh, move DNA from here to there, from the place where it, you know, it's taken along the surface, along the substrate, to deliver it to the location where it's been analyzed, so it may be damaged just by a large uh, pressure gradient. Uh, okay, so what else? And then, while thinking, we came across uh, the experimental paper by Howard Stone and George Whiteside in Harvard, I'm talking about it 2000. Three. Oh, it's already a decade. Wow. Okay. So uh, Stone was then Stephen Harvard uh, before moving to Princeton, and he's a very student. Actually, there was one more. Uh, I probably forgot to put him. Anyway, uh, what they did is the following. Imagine a solid substrate, but the solid the substrate now it somehow doesn't work. No, here it works, and there. Do you see anything? Oh, okay, now I see. Okay, imagine you have a substrate which is not uh, flat. And, uh, uh, okay, so now if you put a liquid film here on top of it and uh, hit the surface from below, uh, of and even ima imagine that, that uh, the substrate is perfectly conducting. Okay? So basically, because of the topography of the, uh, the substrate, the temperature here along the, the substrate, along the contact line between the liquid and, and the solid, is not uniform anymore. So then you think that uh, something may happen, something abnormal may happen. Okay. And what they did is the following. So they put a film here on top of this surface. That's exactly something like here or like here. And they hit it from below. What happened is the following. There were several instances that uh, the film, the, uh, some flow emerged inside the film. And in some cases, the flow field was something like this. So which means one period or, or, or the domain which occupied uh, <coughs> one wavelength of the substrate developed a sort of a picture or structure like this, so which means that two cells, two uh, circulating cells emerged in one period. Okay. 
in some other cases, and actually they even quantified this, they said, okay, if, if LP is, a lambda P is a period of this uh, uh, surface structure, uh, so then if the film is around uh, one half of this lambda P thick, so then uh, this structure prevails. Now, if they put, uh, when they put a thicker film of a thickness in the order of lambda P itself, of the periodicity of the, of the wall, so then they saw something else. So the whole, th uh, the in instead, of, uh, uh, instead of two cells per period, they got one. Okay. And then, actually, they played with the temperatures, with, uh, more precisely with the temperature difference between the substrate and the outer air. And what they found, it was actually remarkable. Actually, this is a shadow graph uh, a picture of both cases. And actually, the uh, brighter shades correspond to the upwelling floor. And uh, there, the temperatures are higher. And the darker shades correspond to a uh, flow directed downward and where the, the temperatures are low. And to their uh, kind of big surprise, I would imagine, when they used a, a left-right asymmetric substrate, okay, uh, so they got a net flow. So in this case, uh, well, there is a flow to the right, there is a flow to the left, but there is a net flow which is directed in the direction of this arrow going to the right. In this case, uh, it was a net flow going to the left, and uh, this was kind of remarkable. Okay, now. Uh, now let's look at this graph. Now this graph shows you this axis is just delta T, the, the temperature, a temperature drop between the temperature uh, uh, here under, un, on the underside of the of the substrate and the temperature somewhere far, far above. Okay. So this is the temperature. Don't be afraid about 130 degrees. First, it was uh, the working fluid was not water but silicon oil. First and second, uh, it was uh, uh, the okay, overall temperature drop. So, so actually, the temperature drop across the film itself was probably six or seven degrees or something like that. Okay, and it was not evaporating or boiling. Okay, anyway, and v this is the mean velocity in the in the x direction. Okay, in millimeters per minute. Okay, not really supersonic. Well, anyway, okay, so they fixed many, many things and now they varied the delta T and measured uh, the net flow, uh, flow rate and it turned out that at some temperature uh, okay, range, okay, the f uh, V uh, was negative, negative meaning going in this direction and, and then it, re it uh, actually it changes its direction and goes up above zero, which means the flow, the net flow was in the right direction. Okay. So once we, we became aware of, of this work, uh, we started thinking exactly in the same direction. So we said, okay, so that's exactly all, or probably exactly. This is experiment, no theory is uh, involved. Uh, they didn't have any explanation. And actually when I met Howard Stone a few, uh, maybe a year or two ago, he said, oh, I didn't know that, uh, that that anyone follows our, our experiments because nobody did any theory before. Anyway, we said, okay, actually I said, okay, so this might be a good problem for PhD for uh, one of my students, but you know, sometimes, uh, sorry guys, some, sometimes students are slow. You know, they have lots of uh, things to do, a, a teaching, uh, girlfriend, uh, so it takes time. Anyway, so in the meantime, we, decide, we decided to solve a similar problem, but a simpler one. Okay? And this is the problem. Imagine we have a, bi uh, a bilayer system sandwiched between two, uh, two horizontal planes. Actually, it's not important uh, 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 that they are horizontal because uh, gravity, due to many, many factors, we'll discuss this later, uh, gravity is not important. Okay? So basically, two parallel uh, planes. Do you see any, any of these? Ah, okay. 
okay, so uh, okay, one is here, one is here, and what we have between the uh, the planes is actually a system of two fluids. One of them is liquid here, and the other one is gas here, and uh, and uh, with all bunch of properties density and the viscosity, and climatic viscosity and thermal diffusivity and there is a thermal conductivity somewhere. Uh, okay, and there is of course surface tension uh, in between. And of course the geometry of the system is given. Okay. Now, of course we assume the simplest possible simple uh, Newtonian fluids and now we, we want to heat uh, in one of these planes, and we hit uh, the lower one, actually on, well it doesn't really matter uh, whether it's lower one or the upper one, but on the liquid side. Okay, so, but we, we, we hit it uh, in a non-uniform way. In which way? We assume that the temperature here on this uh, liquid side the substrate is, uh, is non-uniform, it goes around a certain temperature which is called TW0 and we assume that TW0 is, is larger than T0 which is the temperature of the ceiling and, and it has some deformation okay so the deformation is uh, of, the, of the amplitude alpha, uh, amplitude A with a, uh, and multiplied by TW0 and this deformation it has sinusoidal form of course, you can do any kind of uh, function, but we started with sine, we like it the most. Okay, and, okay. and this sine has uh, this kind of structure, which means it's a wave, that's why we call it thermal wave, okay, of a certain wavelength of L, and we impose a, a possibility of, uh, for this thermal wave to move with a frequency omega. Sometimes omega is zero, meaning that the thermal wave is standing. And sometimes, at, most of the times, it's, uh, omega is non-zero, so it's moving. And as I said, we, uh, we assume that delta t, uh, the, uh, the temperature drop across the system, uh, which is the difference between Tw0 and T0, uh, between the temperatures, the mean temperature of the floor and the temperature of the ceiling, it's larger than zero, so there is some potential of doing something interesting. Okay, so I think, and uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, I think I don't need to introduce the main player here, Mangoni effect, so I, I can safely omit this, uh, this stuff. So, um, okay. So basically, a Marangoni effect is uh, present here. And uh, because of the fact that delta T is actually positive, so the Marangoni effect has a potential to induce some, uh, some flow and to do some interesting effects here in this system. Okay. And it may, of course, it cause instability of the system. Okay. So, so now uh, we uh, we are thinking, or we were thinking about uh, a theoretical approach, but it turns out that uh, well, a natural theoretical approach here is definitely to use long wave theory. Of course, if if uh, uh, basic assumptions are satisfied, but then you realize after you sit down and spend a few hours just deriving of. You know, all of these equations, or first writing the equations of the boundary conditions, then you understand that, that it's hard to make a progress here uh, without making any, uh, any assumptions, any additional assumptions, which sometimes they may look uh, sort of uh, questionable. Uh, for example, uh, for example, uh, one of the assumptions was, uh, made here, I know what, let me, okay, I will not say it now in a few, in a minute. Okay, so, so you start working out uh, all these uh, uh, long wave theory things, so, so what you are saying is the following, that the mean thickness of the liquid and the gas layer is much smaller than the typical wavelength of the disturbance, well, well that's okay. 
it's uh, nothing wrong about this. By the way, I must say the following, that if you have a problem uh, which doesn't have a typical wavelength in this direction, and for example, think about uh, a temperature on the floor, or on both floor and ceiling, and the temperature is uniform. So in this direction, you don't really have a natural wavelength. Okay? Once you impose uh, a thermal wave like this, or maybe different, uh, a functional form, but uh, you have a, a, a wavelength of the imposed temperature, so then you have, in the x direction, you have a, a, a natural wavelength, which is just the wavelength of this thermal wave. You can change it, you can play with it, you can make it larger, make it smaller, but you have a natural measure in this direction, natural scale. Okay? So, uh, so that's why it's not a big deal just to, to assume that this epsilon could be much smaller than one, and then you do all of these scalings, which are absolutely standard for, uh, for longer theory, nothing is new here. And now, now you start making your assumptions. Well, first is the system, you want your system to be not far from equilibrium, and I will come back to this assumption. Why you want this? Because, because uh, if you are far from equilibrium, which is just, just hit conduction uh, across the system, okay? And then if you are far from it, so then you must think what to do with the, with the advection, which is there, okay? Uh, okay, order one Reynolds number effect, okay? Uh, because if you have them, well, you are in a problem uh, how to proceed, okay, because something is not working well. So I want to make this uh, assumption, and we'll come back several times to this assumption uh, uh, in the next hour. Okay, now, uh, the next assumption, no gravity. Well, no gravity, well, you say, okay, you fly to, to some other planet, do your experiment. Fine. Or you make your, your system small. Okay, if it's very small, and you will see what we uh, uh, we made up our test case is for the system which is 0 0.1 of millimeter for the liquid and 0 0.3 of millimeter for gas, uh, gravity is not really uh, very important and definitely buoyancy is not there because there, I mean, once you are, at least for water, below one millimeter thick, okay, so you can forget about, uh, safely, you can forget about buoyancy and deal only with the Marangoni effect. Okay, so this is certain, uh, certainly not uh, not a problem. Sorry, Alex. Yes, please. Do you mean uh, buoyancy is not important, but gravity still yes? So the no, 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 no. Buoyancy is not there, but we don't have gravity because actually, actually, we did uh, the same for gravity. Well, gravity it changes numbers, but nothing, nothing important. Uh, I mean, instead of five, you have six. Uh, right. Something. Uh, it's it's minor, minor. Thing. But you can put it safely there and just, okay, rerun this. Numbers will slightly move. Okay, and now this is a crucial assumption, and I will come back to this again and again. D, well, it's not an assumption. We know that the uh, viscosity of, uh, li of liquid is certainly much higher than the viscosity. Uh, we can think about the following, that the dynamics of the liquid, of the barrier system, can be, or the dynamics of the liquid phase, of the gas phase, can be effectively decoupled. Decoupled means you don't, you don't need to solve them all together and then you have a problem. Okay, but you can say, okay, uh, they don't, don't hear or didn't hear about each other and the only remembrance, the only remnant of this interaction, of this uh, the coexistence of these two phases is just a heat conduction in the base state. Okay? This is also, I must say, uh, this is a question in general terms. Okay? So that's why you see theoretical approaches, not approach, and this is just number one. So that's why we come back again and again to the necessity of uh, okay, bring an independent expert second opinion and ask him whether you are okay or not okay with absolutely different tools. Okay, so we'll come back to this later. Okay, so in this model, uh, the thermal problem is coupled. So at leading order, or at least at the equilibrium, or not far from equilibrium, still what's prevailing 
is that uh, just conduct it conduction across the layer, across the bilayer system, and then it's easy to solve for temperature film in both uh, phases. And then, once you do this, and once you decide that uh, there is a decoupling between the two phases, so you can proceed, but then again, don't forget to ask for a second opinion. Okay. Okay, now the parameters of the probe. First, let me introduce this guy. This is dimensionless frequency of the thermal wave. Okay? So this is omega, remember capital omega, this is the frequency of the wave. Uh, so uh, small omega, lowercase omega, this is uh, this guy. Okay, dimensionless in uh, therm uh, yeah, thermal time units. Uh, it's shown here, and the basic assumption will assume that it's small. Okay, this is a further epsilon. Why? Because if you if you are either faster or slower than epsilon, then you can. Okay, remember we we spoke about. I think it was on Monday when we spoke about scaling through this uh, uh, kinematic boundary condition. So so uh, so now you have an additional time, and you want the time scale due to the movement of the, or propagation of the wave to be the same, so that's why you must assume that it's order epsilon, otherwise it will not work. At least in this way. And then we have uh, the whole bunch of parameters. Uh, we have, uh, okay, let me start for a change from the left. Okay, we have a geometrical parameter delta, which is just the ratio between the thicknesses of the film. And then we have a parameter number, a body number, by the way, Okay, F, this is a subscript for uh, fluid, uh, for liquid properties, and G is for gas properties, okay? So most of the things are scaled with the, uh, with the liquid properties, like one body number is expressed via delta T, and delta T, this is uh, the, uh, the temperature drop between the mean temperature of the floor and the temperature of the ceiling. Okay, H, think about, it's sort of bilayer, uh, bilayer, uh, Bio number, sort of bio number, which comes from the continuity of uh, thermal flux through the the, uh, the interface. Well, delta is definitely incorporated here, or one over delta. So you can look at this H as just the ratio between between the thermal conductivities, but it's also at the same time sort of bio number, bilayer. Okay, and this is C. We all know it already, it's uh, inverse capillary. Okay, and then we introduce one a new guy, omega bar, and this omega bar is just order one, uh, sort of cousin uh, for this omega, so it's just omega bar is just epsilon to minus one omega, omega is order, uh, order epsilon, so this omega bar is order one. Okay, and then we assume, again, we have to assume that the capillary effects are there, and we assume that the inverse capillary number is large, uh, as one over epsilon to the third, and we assume that the one body number is also large, as is of order of epsilon to minus one. Okay. Fine. So, okay, so now a few details. Well, basically, as I said, they uh, use asymptotic expansions along the guidelines we discussed the other day, and then at leading order in epsilon, you have the thermal problem, which is conductive across the layer. Uh, you find everything, the solution is just a piecewise linear function in Y, no big surprises here, and uh, the temperature at the interface you want to calculate it, at Y equal H, H again, that's the location of the interface between the two faces, again, it's, it can be corrugated, uh, it, it can be formed, and be very in time and space, and uh, <coughs> the interfacial temperature you get in this form, where all bunch of parameters are present here. Let me remind you, okay, A, this is the amplitude of the corrugation of the temperature wave, and this, this F tilde function, this is the sine. But basically, if you don't like sine, you can use e cosine, so your F will be cosine. Oh, it's a matter of And then, finally, after some time, you get the evolution equation in this form, uh, again, subscript for x is just uh, a derivative, partial derivative with respect to x. Then it's uh, more convenient to rescale it back to the physical prescale uh, 
uh, in quantities and then finally you get uh, this this uh, Russian equation you want to solve and this okay now it's not it, it's not f tilde it's f hat uh, this function for for the new variables psi which is sort of x and it tau is sort of tau okay. so uh, so we want to work with this uh, with this guy I'm sure that you recognize this guy from the previous talks. Well, this one looks a little bit different. By the way, if you if you take a to zero, so then you get back the equation which was derived by Ivan Hoof and uh, Sweeney and uh, uh, Schatz, all of this McCormick, all of these people, uh, JFM 1997 or eight something. Okay, so we want to solve this equation and to see what happens. Uh, we want to solve this equation and uh, now with periodic boundary conditions in long peri uh, periodic domain uh, how long is long I will tell you next and with initial condition look here flat so actually you can start with, uh, with uh, a corrugated initial condition but actually if you substitute one a constant uh, initial condition here for, uh, for A which is not zero so it's not satisfied so it will evolve okay so that's why we begin with a flat uh, Okay, so basically what we are interested in, it's not in the time and space evolution of, uh, of the interface, but we want to get some profits uh, from here. For example, like what we want to basically, we, we want to know what would be the, the interfacial velocity in the x direction, for example, but that's easy because once we know we know h at every time at every uh, special point, so we can calculate this, use this expression and calculate the, the interfacial velocity. And the most important thing is this q guy, and this q that's a uh, mass flow rate in the x direction. So again, once we know this, so we can calculate this and see how it evolves, and how it behaves. And this will be the main, uh, main thing. Among others. Okay, so I spoke about uh, some questionable assumptions which allowed us to, to derive the equation and to carry out the analysis, but then we say, okay, the, well, I hope I delivered the message. Uh, there are some questionable uh, uh, assumptions, uh, so you want to check whether you are far away from the reality, from reality, or you are next to reality, or you are a reality and the rest is uh, just fake. So you want to see. Okay, so that's why uh, we venture into this terrible incognita of uh, solving uh, numerically Navier-Stokes equations with, uh, with, uh, uh, with, the, with the heat equation, with the energy equation. Okay, and then, uh, okay, so we have this continuity equation, the Navier-Stokes equation, and uh, the heat equation. And now uh, they, uh, they wanted to use a uh, uh, VOF method, so, so uh, you have to put some, somehow uh, surface tension, but surface tension, uh, it's not a function, it's sort of functional, which is defined only along the surface, and the surface uh, is a part of, of the solution itself. So this method actually uh, gives you or prescribes certain way how to do this so, so there is a fake functional which appears here okay as a body force but this body force is sort of concentrated along along the surface you see the delta function s delta function along the surface okay uh, and of course this is fine as long as uh, the deformation of the surface is not very big once you get very close to, 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 uh, to rupture, so there is, you have a very large deformation, so then it becomes to be questionable, it becomes to be sort of, uh, you have to put many more points there uh, to resolve the numerical uh, issue, and uh, sometimes it may take uh, a long time, so every method has its limitations and its benefits, advantages, disadvantages, that's all life is about. Anyway, 
uh, okay, using BOF for you know, tracking the locations of, of the interface, you introduce some uh, function which is normally called color function, which is one at one side of the interface, zero at the other side, and uh, you try to solve all of this, and uh, that's what you do. And this will be a, a sort of second opinion f to compare with uh, uh, the predictions of the long wave theory. So we'll come back to this later. Okay, so this is the bilayer system which served us as a test case. Okay, so okay. So liquid is water. In the previous version of this uh, uh, file, which means yesterday, it was liquid water and gas water. Okay, so I changed it. Okay, so gas is air. And uh, well, there are a bunch of uh, properties here, but the most important thing is that the thickness of the liquid layer is 0 0.0001 in meters. Okay, so it's just 0 0.1 of millimeter, a very shallow layer, and the gas which is also important, but it's, uh, it's three times thicker than the liquid. Oh, and uh, a list of properties which are not really important now. Okay, so now the question is, we are going uh, to explore what happens with, with A, which is not zero, which means the temperature of the floor is, is not uniform. What happens, let's first talk about the uniform case, okay, just, just for reference. Okay, so what do we know? We know the following thing. Okay, if the parameter set for for our system corresponds to linearly stable case, so then life is simple. Okay, you have a disturbance, it decays. After some time, you come back, you see everything is flat, nothing to write home. Okay, so this is a trick. Second, if the parameter set corresponds to linearly unstable case. Now, now it becomes interesting. So then it evolves. Now the question is where it evolves. And it turns out that if A is zero, so, so the film ruptures at some time, okay, at some later stage. So somewhere in the pyramid domain, at some time, local thickness becomes zero or next to zero. Actually, in this case, it will be zero, by the way, much faster than in the reality of our case, much faster than on the cylinder we said that it's possible to prove that that's infinite. Here it's finite just because of the fact that, uh, that's for the mathematicians, uh, the capillary term, the one with the fourth order the derivative, it, it's proportional to h cubed. However, the driving force for instability, which is my body, is proportional to h squared. Okay, there, remember, both of them were h cubed. So they were sort of equilibrated for small h. However, for in this case, h squared is larger than h cubed for small h. So that's why it will drive it faster toward rupture, and the rupture, it may be proven, it, uh, it will occur, occur uh, at the final. But anyway, so now we have a competition between whom and whom. So there is a tendency to rupture. Uh, and now the question is, if the film wants to rupture, it means somewhere the local thickness will decrease. Okay, where will this water go? It will go somewhere else, okay? So somewhere at the expense of this uh, sorry, decrease of the thickness, somewhere the thickness will increase, okay? So now we understand that if there is a sort of a, a finger uh, going down from something like this, Uh, okay, so this is the beginning of the story, so now it moves toward rupture, something like this, okay? Now the question is, if you remove liquid from here, so it goes to this side and to this side, so these guys become fatter, okay? So there is a competition between the two factors. On one hand, this guy wants to go down, but on the other hand, this guy wants to go up. Okay, so it accumulates liquid and removed it from here. So now there is a competition between rupture down and rupture up. Okay, rupture down means the local thickness of the liquid film will be zero. <coughs> or if this one goes up faster, so then this one will okay, touch with its head 
the ceiling, so the gas layer will rupture. So the competition, okay, who is going to rupture first? Okay, so that's why I wrote that. And, uh, and uh, uh, actually what we would like, we would like the system to disallow uh, okay, rupture up. Why? Because, as you will see, uh, I will bring water to the thin locations and will sort of replenish these uh, dryish spots. And uh, so we don't want this guy to rupture up because then the evolution will stop and uh, we'll need to run it again for a different set of parameters. That's why, actually, the gas layer is three times thicker than the, uh, the water layer. It doesn't go. It always wants to first rupture up, eh, sorry, rupture down and not rupture up, so it can it continue forever. Okay. Uh, yeah. And now, if you carry out your weekly nonlinear analysis, for, still for the case of A equals zero, okay, you carry your, out your uh, weekly nonlinear analysis, then you find that bifurcation is supercritical. Hey, sorry, subcritical. Now, for subcriticality, it's again, I mean, your equation is, for the amplitude, is something like this, uh, epsilon a plus some um, mu uh, a uh, squared a, and mu is larger than zero, and epsilon is larger than zero, okay? So you are linearly unstable, and you have, you don't have saturation at the nonlinear uh, stage, at least at at the cubic level, okay, so it means that actually the, the amplitude of your solution wants to increase. Again, going in the same, same direction when you increase with, with time. When you increase the amplitude, so it means either it will, uh, you will remove fast the liquid from, uh, take it from somewhere, uh, from the thin spot and then it will rupture down, or you accumulate liquid so fast it will touch the ceiling with its head. So it, they go in the same direction. No, I was, uh, I didn't want to. That's how it works. It goes by itself. Anyway, let's. Okay, I reveal the secret. Okay, fine. Okay, so let's start uh, this uh, numerical investigation of this uh, system. I would like to begin with the simple case. What is a simple case? Simple case is when for a equals zero the system is linearly stable. So which means if A equal to zero, nothing happens, you make a disturbance, go home, you come back, nothing happened, everything is flat and quiet, and it's boring. Okay, so this is the case I would like to begin with, but now okay, A is not zero. Okay, so it's not that trivial. Once A is not zero, so what you have, this is uh, the, the temperature It works? Yes. I can see it. Yes, you see it's a set line. Now it goes Well, it's somewhere, anyway. And let, <laughs> let me press, it will hit somewhere. <laughs> Probability to hit a, a certain point is zero, but it hits somewhere. So, <laughs> so you look there. Okay, fine. <laughs> Just to attract our attention. Uh, yeah, exactly. So. Just to make you looking for <laughs> For this spot. Okay. Anyway, so this is this is uh, how the thermal wave looks like. Okay. Okay. A equals zero. Uh, sorry. Sorry. A is not zero. But I want to start with a static thermal wave, which is omega equal to zero. Okay. So the thermal wave will be static. It will look like sine. You want the sign, it will appear like the sign. And what you see above, this is a typical solution coming from the Navistox equations. Typical solution showing uh, the flow field and the shape of the interface between the gas phase and the liquid phase. And this is a steady state. So, for some value of this, oh, now I see, of, of this A, A is 0.1. Not very large uh, this, uh, deformation of the temperature to profile, one well number is 100. Okay, L, well, L is 25, it's not exactly 25. Okay, every value for L you see, you have to multiply by about 8. 
So this is actually one to, to 200. This is the system for the liquid layer. Okay? So liquid is one in these uh, units and the length is 25 times 8, so it's 200 times larger than the thickness. Okay? So it's a really long system. Okay, so, so what you see, you see a steady state, which says uh, this, the system comes at, and that's how the surface, the interface separating between the two faces looks like. Now, is it logical? Yes, it's logical, because see, here the temperature is, is the minimal. If you, if you have minimal temperature at uh, somewhere on the floor, okay, so if this is not far from conduction, so the temperature here at the interface will be lower. Now, if it's lower, the surface tension is higher, okay. If it's higher, then, then, uh, uh, then okay, here at this location, uh, the temperature is higher, so the surface tension is lower, so there will emerge a shear stress pumping water from, from uh, in the direction of the surface gradient of surface tension, which means from the lower surface tension location to higher surface tension location. So to take water from here, we bring it here, a pile it up there, so that's what you see. But in addition, what you see is the following. By the way, I forgot to introduce the color, the colors. So the color code is actually the opposite to the intuitive one. Why? Because it looks more photogenic. Uh, so, the brighter colors are, uh, they correspond to hotter temperature, to higher temperature, and darker colors correspond to lower temperature. Well, just to make fun of it, but it looks better. Actually, I don't know why, but we checked it and that was fun. Anyway, another feature of this field. See these green lines? Okay, now I see. Okay, here, the green lines. So, it turns out that the whole uh, flow field broke up into several pieces. Okay, in this piece, within here and here, so there is one vortex going in the fluid, in the liquid phase, one in the in the gas phase, and exactly in the direction along the surface, it goes from here to here. So it goes like this and goes back, and here it, again it goes like here and goes back, and the same on this side and on this side, just a periodic extension of one another. And what's most important, this is the steady state. Okay, so you can create non-trivial steady state just by imposing a static thermal. Okay, so it's not very exciting, but nevertheless. Okay, so now again we want to check what happens with the. Uh, I mean, first we want we know that that this uh, the final destination is the steady state, but but now we want to see what the both models give us. Okay, so the convention from now, uh, uh, a convention from now in on will be the following. The, the uh, solid curves correspond to the Navier-Stokes and all kinds of broken curves will correspond to the long wave uh, uh, approximation. Okay, so for example, okay, let's begin with this. Okay, so what do we see here? We see here the interfacial shape within one period coming from, uh, we said it's the same state. Okay, it's a it's exactly the same. Okay. So, uh, okay. So it's, it's, it's like exactly for the previous case which I showed you with this uh, colors. Anyway, this is what you find from the Navier stones, and this is what you find from the the long wave theory, so the, there is a uh, well, good agreement. Not, uh, after all, long wave approximation is approximation. I mean, we would not expect that the approximation is uh, exactly the same <laughs> as the original, because otherwise you would say, okay, so the approximation, this is the real thing, and the rest is not important. Okay. But what again... What is the aspect ratio to compare? What? What is the aspect ratio to make a comparison? For Navier-Stokes you... Here, it's 1 to 200. One to two hundred. So, so this was actually, you see, I mean, you have to. Pr I mean, nothing in this life is uh, for free. In in the US, people say there is no free lunch. I mean, moreover, there nothing is for, for free. Okay. So, 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 if you want to solve the stocks equations, so well, you have a certain accuracy, and uh, so there is certain extent when you can <laughs> solve your equations because otherwise, it, 
if it's not 1 to 200, 1 to 5,000, so then you put many more points and then uh, you count years before you, you get your solution back. So that's, uh, that's the thing. Anyway, so this is the difference in the maximum, I think it's somewhere around 7-8% in the, the formation. But again, I mean, this is also steady state, so they look uh, pretty much similar. Now, this is temporal, so we, we still want to, to sort of to, to check our intuition and to compare both the methods just to see what we get. Here, for example, we show you uh, the temporal evolution of several things. First, okay, H max, the maximal thickness of the film, these are these guys. Uh, well, that's exactly, I mean, finally, uh, they go to the same difference. Uh, this is the minimal thickness of the film in both models. And this is delta H, which is the difference between the maximal and the minimal thickness. So they go quite well, but well, sometimes at some stage they separate. And by the way, we didn't show here, but basically on this curve, you can test actually your, uh, test your linear stability theory. So for some time up to here, uh, they were exactly the same the curves and then they deviate because numeric, uh, sorry, not numeric, but nonlinear effects took a place more seriously. Okay. okay. One more thing which is quite interesting for this static thermal wave case. Uh, okay, so there are several parameters, as you may notice, uh, uh, for this problem. If there is A, the deformation of the temperature profile. There is a Marangoni number, of course, the main hero here, and there is the length of the of the of the weight. So we want to see which one we derive in which direction. Okay. So, uh, for example, here. Do you see? No. No. Oh, some. No, it's probably the battery is low. Well, here I can see it because it's dark. There. Ah, no. Is it the Well, I press, uh, but it does something else. Yeah. Well, anyway, the upper graph. The upper graph shows the deformation of the film uh, at its steady state as a function of, of the Marangoni number from 0 to 1000. And where, okay, L is changing, which means, okay, A is fixed. So you have a certain deformation of the temperature profile. And now you see what happens with variation of the wavelength of the, of the thermal wave and when Marangoni number is changing. So what you see first, well, if you fix L as well, so, so uh, for the deformation, well, it goes the right direction. The larger is the Marangoni number, so the larger is the deformation. It's kind of expected, I would say. But what is not expected, uh, okay, so for example, the red curve, it's for smaller n. L equal, L equal 10, it means actually 1 to 80. 1 to 80. Okay. So, it goes like this, monotonically, but then if you switch to 15, 15 is 120. Okay, Even slightly more. Uh, okay, so then it's again the same uh, behavior, but it stops somewhere. See? I look first at the curves, and then uh, the symbols are uh, from the long wave theory. Okay, the curves are coming, or the field symbols are from, uh, from the number steps. So it stops somewhere. At uh, 400, for example, the blue curve stops. Yeah, right here, that was it. Okay? It, okay, around the deformation of 1.6. Okay, so, and we did not continue this. Why? Uh, it's not a fact that we were lazy. Maybe we are lazy, but not in this case. Uh, why we stopped it? Because of the film rupture. So, so for the given length of domain, if you increase the Marangoni number, so what it happens? It ha it behaves like okay, a equals zero. Okay, so it wants to rupture, and it ruptures. So because you cre you create such a large deformation of the temperature, so the, the stress becomes so big, it drives water out of the location of the higher the temperature, and then it breaks everything. Now, if you, if you increase, increase L even more, so you see the, the behavior is the same, but it stops earlier. 
stops error because you have a larger duvet, so you have more flexibility for your film. Imagine if you have a, a, a ruler made not of wood but of uh, some uh, flexible uh, material, metal, for example. You press it. If it's if it's a short ruler, so it, it will remain straight. But if it's longer enough, okay, so then it will buckle. So so it has some some uh, more action to be to be taken within a certain domain. That's exactly this. Okay, so now let's look uh, at the lower graphs. So the lower graph shows us the deformation of the film when one body number changes for different A's but for a given A, for a given length of the periodic domain. Again, it's the same, same story. Uh, the deformation increases with the modern body number, but for a smaller, smaller A, it increases uh, slower than for larger A. You have larger A, uh, you bring not a little hammer, uh, you strike the film with a big hammer, so then it will deform more and will break earlier. Okay? And again, uh, I mean the, the deformation is about 1.6 before breakage. Okay? So there is some interesting feature of this number, at least here. Okay, so now a more interesting case. Okay, a propagating uh, thermal wave. Okay, so now when we think about the propagating wave, think about the following. We move the thermal wave. So the location of, of the minimal temperature, for example, in the, in the, on the floor, it's, uh, it's moving. Well, actually everything is moving. Okay, but let's follow the, min the location of the minimal temperature. It's moving. Okay? When it's moving, so, so the, the, the temperature is minimal, the, the, the surface tension is maximal, so this is the location which will attract the water from the neighbors. Okay? So if we move this guy, so definitely this location will also be moving. Okay? So it will follow somehow this, because this is the source of, of your activity here, but definitely the liquid will not respond immediately. It will respond after some time. So the point is the following, there should be, and there is, some phase lag, which we, uh, which, uh, we call delta phi. Okay, and this is the, the phase lag, and this is the difference or the distance between the location of the minimal temperature and the maximal deflection of the of the film interval. Okay, and we'll follow it, we'll measure it, and we'll see some very unexpected properties of this uh, uh, value. Uh, some of them we cannot explain. We see them clearly. Uh, you will see them very shortly, but we cannot explain, we cannot solve numerically, uh, sorry, analytically, because it's far beyond any possibility to solve anything analytically. Anyway, I will come to this later. So this is a typical example when the system for A equal to zero is linearly stable. Now A is non zero, omega is non zero, the, uh, the thermal wave is propagating. And this poor uh, guy interface, it f follows it, and we say that there must be uh, some phase lag, and there is phase lag. Now, if you look here, if you look at this uh, uh, structure of the flow field, again, the color convention is the same, is counterintuitive in the same way like in the previous one. Okay, so the brighter shades are uh, higher temperatures and the vice versa. Okay, so. Uh, again, this is now uh, the interface, looks like this. The maximum location is somewhere here of the interface, the maximum deflection. This is the location of the minimum temperature, this guy is also moving. Now, again, the flow field uh, sort of disintegrated into several vortices. Now, one vortex in the liquid phase, one vortex about, above it in the gas phase, but the whole thing is moving now, okay? So these green lines, oh, very good, thank you. Let's keep together first, like the point. Ah, okay, so I must, so it's like a joystick. Okay, so now I have to, <laughs> I have to, <laughs> to compete with my children. Okay, fine. <laughs> Do you see? You go, you go, you go. The yellow one. The yellow one. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. So, uh, okay, 
So it's no wonder I don't see it. Do you see it now? Yes. 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 Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Fine. I thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, so the the flow field is integrated into the vortex, the vortices. But these vortices now they are moving. So these green lines. Uh, they are moving. So this vortex system is moving, propagating in the right direction, following the thermal wave. Now, uh, if you ask me what happens with this solution and with the others, they look like traveling waves. They look like, which means they, well, if I, put, if I put one on top of the other and shift them uh, and put, pile them up, uh, to check whether it's the same shape, uh, well, if I close uh, my eyes, both eyes, they are definitely of the same shape. When I open one of the two, uh, well, there is some noise. Now, this noise, it looks like, well, and then you, you ask, okay, whether this noise is, is uh, sort of random, maybe numerically, Induced or maybe not, it doesn't seem to be numerically induced. So it has some coherence with uh, when you uh, perform FFT. Uh, so you see that one of the peaks it corresponds to this omega, and then it says, well, it's it probably it's related to this forcing. But this noise is very small, and it doesn't go away when you increase the uh, accuracy of your computation. So which means it's nearly traveling wave, but. Uh, but not strictly speaking. Okay, now which one? Okay, now it's the same case. A propagating thermal wave. So now, uh, now I would like to see the form. Now I have, I have, okay, omega in my hands, another uh, control parameter. So I would like to move uh, waves faster and faster, and to see what effect I get. Okay, so this is uh, the graph showing us again in the facial shapes. Uh, uh, for both uh, Navier-Stokes and long wave theory uh, in one period and uh, in the facial shapes for different omegas, different uh, speeds or different frequencies of the thermal wave uh, and again uh, solid curves are for uh, Navier-Stokes and, uh, and uh, dashed curves are for long wave theory. Now what we do, we shift this way because they are propagating, okay? So just for a comparison, we shift them, I forgot, uh, well, definitely I think it's written here, or maybe not in the paper. Anyway, we shift them in such a way that the maximum of the temperature the profile is at 0 0.75, somewhere here. Okay, just to, to align them, to see what happens. Okay, so what do we see? For this blue guy, omega equals zero, this, these are, uh, this is double stop, this is a uh, uh, long wave theory. Well, again, I mean, there is some 8, 9 percent, 7 to, to 9 percent difference, which is not really big, but, uh, well, it's, uh, it's substantial, but, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, sort of qualitative uh, analysis or the results of qualitative analysis are always the same. Okay. okay, now you start moving this guy faster and faster, so you go from this one to the red one. Okay, what is the main feature? The height decreased. Why is that? Well, because you move your film. Uh, sorry, you move your thermal wave. The film is moving after it. But because of the fact that, that you move, you bring water to bad locations, to, to the desert, okay? So you put more and more water, so it doesn't want to rupture any more faster. It, it wants, but it cannot, okay? So that's why this, it doesn't go deeper, so this guy doesn't go up, okay? So that's why it goes like this, okay? So, so the minimal thickness, of course, goes up and the maximum goes down. Uh, and again, going from the red one to the green one, it's the same direction, but the yellow, yeah, and finally for large, uh, uh, for large, well, not large, but, uh, but for, uh, for larger value of 0 0.18, uh, I, will, I will comment the word or two uh, immediately about that, it's almost flat. 
it's not flat, it's about a 2% of, of, uh, of the mean thickness. Okay, so now don't, don't forget, you may ask why I didn't use omega equal to 5. Okay, remember, remember omega should be small, or the epsilon. Okay, so 5, not exactly on the epsilon. Maybe, but not all of it. Anyway, okay. Now, this is the interfacial velocity, and this is also a very important factor here. The interfacial velocity, which means along the surface, in the, in the x direction. Okay, so for omega equal to zero, this is the guy. And again, the correspondence look uh, is quite nice between the two. Okay, now what happens if you move uh, the thermal wave faster? What would you expect? Uh, the thermal interfacial velocity will increase or decrease, of course, I and mean, basically the amplitude definitely should increase because you move it faster, uh, so some, some, somehow it must follow it. So you move the thermal wave faster, so the wave will go faster. Or, sorry, the, uh, the liquid will flow faster, okay? It doesn't mean that the wave will, will go faster, but, but the velocities will, will become uh, higher. Okay. Now there is one interesting thing, I should say. The, not the most interesting, but one, one of the... Look at uh, the graph, uh, this graph, which shows you the flow rate with respect to omega. Now, the flow rate, remember we, we define the flow rate. Now, the flow rate is a function of time and, and x, because it's a local. Now, to make some integral value, we integrate it. So, we have function of, actually, time here. This is a net flow so to speak, okay? If you have EQ non zero, so it means something is moving, something is flowing somewhere, okay? So this is Q as a function of omega. Now, this is a function of tau, of time, so we wait until everything is equilibrated and then we measure. Okay, fine. So now, uh, okay, omega is changing and, uh, for different values of the Marangoni number. Now, uh, what happens is uh, the following. For sufficiently smaller omega, the flow rate goes up. For sufficiently larger omegas, it goes down. Okay. For actually for every Marangoni number. Why is that? Well, the hint is exactly what I said. On the one hand, if you move omega faster, if you go to a larger values of omega, what you have the 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 velocities increase. Okay. However, when you go to higher, to larger value of omega, the field flattens out. Okay, so now, if you have a larger cross-section, so you, and, and you have a faster flow, so you can bring more, more fluid. But if you have a thinner field, so uh, you cannot move more liquid because there is no place to go. Okay, so which means, so there are two competing factors here. Okay which compete, and that's exactly what you see. There is a distinct maximum for this flow rate with respect to omega. Okay. Okay, now. And by the way, I mean, again, I mean, the, the field symbols are for nugget stones, and the open symbols are for, uh, for long wave theory. I mean, fine differences. There are some, but not really. Explicit. Anyway, now let's move to a different thing, which is the phase lag. Okay, remember we spoke about phase lag. There should be some some retardation of the of the response of the interfacial wave with respect to the thermal wave. But there is a response, and that's how it looks like. It goes like this. Now in this case, well, Marangoni number doesn't, at least in this range, doesn't have any uh, pronounced effect. So which means that these phase lines are uh, almost, almost the same, actually. Uh, Navi stocks and, and uh, a long wave theory on one hand, and when you change Marangoni number in this, in this range, uh, nothing exciting. It happens, you collapse almost on the same curve. But there is one interesting feature, which maybe here it looks trivial, but nevertheless we'll see it later on as well. Look at the location of, of the a maximal value of the flow rate. It's here for this value, here for this value, here for this value. Here, for example, you see there is some difference, some shift 
between the Navier-Stokes equations and the long wave theory, there is a little shift in difference in numbers, of course, but uh, there is a shift. But nevertheless, when you look at the location of the maximum flow rate, fix and check the location in terms of omega, and then look down and check what is the phase lag uh, for the given omega, which is associated with the maximal value of the flow rate, you find very, a very exciting phenomenon, and it's the following. For the Navier-Stokes equations, it turns out that the phase lag corresponding to the maximum flow rate is about, okay, we measure it in, in the units of pi, delta phi divided by pi, 0.3. So if you take this, go down, so it's somewhere here, 0.3. For the long wave theory, it's somewhere 0.35. So, which means, well, if you want to compare and uh, say, okay, I have it too close uh, values, so what is in the middle, in the middle, it, it's about 0 0.33, and it definitely must be one third of pi. Okay? So, <laughs> well, here it's a little bit trivial in the sense that, okay, all of this, it collapsed in the same, on the same curve, but next you will see a totally different thing. It corresponds exactly to somewhere between. Uh, 0 0.3 pi and 0 0.35 pi, and this is quite uh, exciting. Uh, you ask me why? I don't know. Okay, well, it's less. Okay, so now, well, it's still propagating wave, but now, well, different values, different parameter values. Again, the flow rate for different values of A for a larger one one number. Now it's 400, but the domain is shorter. Here it's it, it 10. 10 means it 10 multiplied by, by 8, it's 1, 1 to 80. Sufficiently. Okay, so what do we see here? Here, well, now we see a, a discrepancy here, for example, between the two theories. And here, starting here for two theories, well, here it's less pronounced. Now, yeah, but, but otherwise the, the existence of the maximal uh, flow rate is there. It's a little in different location, but it's qualitatively it's the same. Now I want to ask two questions. First, why is that uh, uh, discrepancy occur? This is the first. And second, how I'm uh, with respect to this one third of power. Okay. So first, why is there a discrepancy? And I think the answer is absolutely clear. A look at the values of, of this omega, where it occurs. It occurs somewhere here, 0 0.8, 0 0.75, somewhere there. Okay. So what was the basic assumption for omega? Omega should be small, or the or the epsilon. Okay. So I would not expect uh, the one-to-one -one agreement uh, for larger omega. Okay, so how large, I don't know. How large is large, I don't know, a priori. How small is small, I don't know. I have to look. Okay, so for this case, it seems that 0.75 is probably not so small value. So that's why there is, there might be, not there is, but there might be a discrepancy. So there is a discrepancy. I would not expect this agreement, a very good agreement, to be up to infinite value for them. Because somewhere they should deviate it. But otherwise, what's... Uh, I mean, how come the approximation works forever? It may, but it's kind of... Uh, it uh, leads to sort of a brow lifting. Anyway, there are certain distinct value of uh, maximal value of, of the flow rate. Now you look at the location of this maximum, you find yourself in 0 0.3. For Navier Stokes, 0.35, Somewhere in that range for, for the long wave theory, and again you are around zero, uh, sorry, one third of pi. And now, when you look at the deviation here for the phase lag, so the phase lag seems to be more sensitive toward this uh, between the, the original equations and the approximation. So you see the deviation starts somewhere here, 0 0.2. Okay, so that's logical. Omega larger than 0.2, sometimes it's small enough, sometimes it's not small, 
uh, sometimes you read books like uh, by Naife, for example, asymptotic analysis, and then uh, you see some asymptotic expansions for small a, a for small epsilon, and then the guy says, okay, let's assume epsilon equal to one, okay, and let's solve. Okay, so one sometimes is small, mostly not that small. Anyway, with uh, respect to time. It's still monotonically going in that direction, right? Uh, it's what, 15 minutes or something like this? At 10 minutes? Okay, so let me increase the speed going to larger omega uh, and, and talking supersonic. Okay, so basically this is the clue. Omega should be ordered with epsilon, so you should not expect a very good agreement for larger omega. And again, similar, similar case, now here, okay, L is changing, and when you change the periodicity size, these guys uh, become very, very sensitive it towards all of these values. Look at the, at, the, at the horizontal scale, the horizontal scale for omega is logarithmic, okay, so it's even, uh, it's much more pronounced. So, so we see all of these guys they are far apart, when we change L for fixed uh, fixed uh, A in the parabolic number, but again, when you look at this maximum value, you find yourself again at 0 0.3 uh, of pi, and it goes on and on and on. And again, the deviation, well, which begins somewhere somewhere here. In this case, for uh, the flow rate, it's less sensitive because it's finally it's sort of integ integral uh, 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 integral value, so it should be less sensitive to uh, to all kinds of approximations. Okay. Okay. One more interesting thing be before we move to the case of the linearly unstable system, which will be short, uh, because we see all of the properties, or most of the properties here. Okay. Here we show the variation of the optimal value of omega, the one which corresponds to the maximum flow rate, with respect as a function of the wavelength. Okay. So all of these guys it, it collapse on the same curve, except for this one. This one belongs to the long wave theory, and this one belongs to L equal 5. L equal 5 means uh, the, the length of the domain is 40. So 1 to 40. Well, apparently for, for uh, the long theory, 1 over 40, well, it's not that small. You can say a priori, but a posteriori you see. Okay, and then they collapse on the same curve. So actually this value is very insensitive to whatever, and, and the range for one, one number is between 0 and, no, well, actually between 0 to 1500, and very wide range for A, and they all collapse on the same curve. Okay, now let's look at the case of the linearly unstable case for A equals zero. Okay, okay. now again, this is a comparison uh, between, again, between long wave theory and non stokes equations, but now it's for different omegas and the Marangoni number is 2500. Now, let me tell you that for this, this parameter set, the, the threshold the linear is, is, is the threshold is for Marangoni somewhere between six, 1600 and 1700. Okay, so that's why in the previous case we checked up to 1500, not crossing uh, the borderline. So it's so the verticality here is large. What and and because of this, because of this, for some especially smaller value of smaller values of this of this omega we see larger deformations, okay? So it wants to go down, it wants to rupture, but you bring water and you don't allow it to rupture because you move it sufficiently fast. You, you put water in the desert, so it may live longer. So actually these guys are also almost <coughs> traveling wave, traveling with a certain speed, and the speed is as certainly associated with, the, with this omega, actually equal to it, but there is a little, oscillation and not numerical os oscillation up and down and a little left right and it doesn't go away with improvement of, of accuracy 
Okay, so what is interesting is the following. Again, if we increase val the value of omega now, this now the competition between the two is one. Okay. Okay, so with increase of omega we get a flatter wave, of course. It's the same same thing. But now let's look at the interface velocity. Sometimes it develops some kind of irregularness, but it's not important here at least. Okay, the important thing is here. Okay, now we, we want to see, we want to look at the, exactly the same quantities like the net flow rate with respect to omega and. <laughs> you know, more than one is many. Do you remember this? Okay, let me use one. Okay, so, so now, okay, the flow rate is a, is a function of omega and the phase lag is a function of omega. Okay, now you see the field symbols coming from uh, the navi equations. You see open symbols coming from the long wave field. Okay, in this domain, we were able to solve the problem for both. And the comparison, well, it's good to me. Well, here there is some deviation because we said the phase lag is a little more sensitive, starts for smaller values of omega, it's consistent. That's fine. But then, look here. It's not that they were lazy to solve the Navier-Stokes equation for that case. No. It turns out to be impossible. Why? Because the deformation is very large. So it goes almost to rupture, doesn't rupture. It's stopped somewhere uh, for small thicknesses. But numerics for the navi stokes equations fails. So again, there is no free lunch. You have a strong tool which doesn't have anything with approximation. You can use it as long as you can. If you cannot, you can. Okay? So that's why you need a symbiosis between the two. Sometimes you can, you can afford it and then you are in good shape. Sometimes you cannot, most of the times you cannot, and then you don't know what you saw, in some sense. Okay, but, so which means that if you look, start looking here and look, uh, look to the left, well, I think it goes to the same place. So the, the, the comparison is good. How about here? Well, I don't know, but it may go this way. But look again here. This is the maximum flow rate. You land some again at about one third of time. Okay, even for this case when your base or reference system is uh, is uh, linearly unstable. Just a few more things. Okay, so this is the case which they cannot resolve for uh, with the Navier-Stokes equations. And look at the shape of the wave. Okay, so this is a time. Uh, this is one. So this is, I don't remember how much is that, but that's in the range of 0 0.15 or something like this. So the deformation is already that large, so they cannot uh, solve it with the uh, normal numerical accuracy. Okay? So, so basically these guys move, move to the right after the thermal wave, this is the interface shape. Okay? So, so you have these bloods, uh, drops, move uh, to the right. Now, this solution, it has a very special value. Why? Because we're coming back to the motivation, we want to move liquid from point A to point B. Now, of course, you, you can say, okay, I have a gravity wave or a gravity capillary wave which runs. Uh, at some stage, it started there, it will reach there. That's absolutely right. But not the same guys will go there. So most of the guys, actually all of them at the interface, they do something like this. Okay, they just send a signal, but they don't go there. Somebody else goes there. Okay, nobody actually goes there. Those who stay there, who live there, they will stay there. But here it's a different. Why it's different? Because you trap the liquid here in this uh, drop. And then it's a periodic structure. And then you trap the liquid. There is no flow rate for these tiny liquid bridges. Okay, so you trap the liquid. It circulates inside the drop, but the whole a drop train 
moves uh, moves in the right direction. So it's it's the other uh, end of this long table. There is a guy collecting the drops and says, "Okay, thank you very much for sending. Send me more." And then you have uh, a constant supply for this guy. Okay. Uh, and I think it's almost the end of the story. Uh, let's skip this and just go to the summary. Well, uh, first, it's uh, okay. It's possible to induce this kind of motion. We call it thermocapillary pumping of uh, of liquid using thermal waves, and uh, actually along along the substrate. And uh, so, uh, pumping results. This thermocapillary pumping results in the non-zero flow rate. Uh, along the substrate, and uh, there is an optimal thermal wave speed for which you get the maximum possible flow rate in the x direction for a given set of the parameters. And to the a great excitement of all of us, uh, the maximum flow rate corresponds to, <laughs> to the phase lag of about one third of pi. Uh, and uh, actually, the comparison between the full Navier-Stokes equations and the longer theory shows to be a very good or sufficiently good for any purpose. After all, don't forget this is approximation which makes everything uh, much easier than just to, to run to the computer and to ask for a favor, please solve me in my equation. It takes long time, and, but the comparison is very good. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.